This episode is supported by MonsterJoysticks.com. Level up your Raspberry Pi with our all-in-one arcade kit using genuine Sanwar arcade parts. Hello cave dwellers, make yourselves comfortable, because today we travel to France to learn about a company who, like many others, desperately wanted to mimic Apple's success in the US. But the other problem is... Mais il y a quelque chose de plus subtil, c'est le facteur culturel. En Europe... They wanted to emulate Acorn Computer's success in the British educational market. And they wanted to set the standard for future micros in Europe. Today we dust off the story of Thompson Computers. This mean-looking machine is the Thompson M05. And this is my M05e, which was designed for export to countries like Italy, Germany and Spain. They're just two models in a range which tell the story of French company Thompson, or Technicolor as the company has been known since 2010. And their decade-long attempt to emulate the success of Apple and corner the home and educational microcomputer market in France. In this series, we'll take a look at this machine in action and we'll learn of the trials and tribulations Thompson went through from 1979 through to 1989 when it was active in the home micro market. But first, where exactly did Thompson come from? It is perhaps ironic then that the story in which France wants to impress its identity on the nation's fledgling home computer industry begins outside its borders with this man, Elihu Thompson, an English man born in 1853, who migrated with his family to the USA aged five. By 1879, he'd become an engineer and formed the Thompson Houston Electric Company with Edwin Houston, a company which went on to merge with the prolific inventor and businessman Thomas Edison to form the famous General Electric Company in 1892. Only a year later, in 1893, a sister company was set up in France which would go on to become the modern Thompson Group as we know it. Its goal to exploit its patents in transport, production and the electricity industries in France. In the 20th century, Thompson became independent of General Electric and spawned sub-companies including Alstom for railways, Brandt for washing machines and fridges, EFCIS for semiconductors who would go on to become ST Microelectronics through subsequent mergers, and Mazda. No, not the car manufacturer, but the makers of batteries and light bulbs. The list of industries and products they're involved in covered everything from sewing machines and movie projectors to weapons, radars and much more. Further acquisitions and restructures saw the company renamed to Technicolor in 2010, a name by which the group is still known today, although the Thompson branding is still used, as we'll find out later. But the period of this company's history I'm really interested in is that of their home computer efforts starting from 1979. It was in this year that Jose Amrad, an employee of Thompson, was chosen to create the microcomputer prototype for widespread home adoption. Thompson did specify that it needed to have a character set compatible with their fledgling Minitel service, as well as connectivity functionality. It should first and foremost be a consumer product that's very forward thinking in the way that the users may interact with the system. And, of course, France had to address the wider issue that high import taxes meant foreign companies like Apple were less likely to come into their market unless major concessions were made by the state to make it worthwhile for them to regionalise their products. The goal, then, was to create France's own homegrown Apple II computer. It's 1980 now and the prototype specifications are revealed for Thompson's first computer, and they are proficient for the time. It houses an 8-bit Motorola 6809E CPU, as also used in the TRS-80 colour computer with up to 32K of RAM. Another division of the company, Thompson EFCIS, was already manufacturing Motorola-compatible processors for the French military. That's the division who would go on to become SD Microelectronics. So the 6809E was a natural choice for them. Very interestingly though, they specified a 320 by 200 resolution, eight color display with a graphical boot menu. Mice were not yet in the mainstream, but an electronic pen was bundled as standard. Innovative and high resolution stuff for the time. 
Some Thompson executives, it's reported, still needed convincing as to how consumers would put this shiny new technology to use. But nevertheless, they said, we oui, we, oui, and they approved the design for the Thompson T07, which went into full development. By 1981, the world was waking up to the idea of home computers following Apple's success in the US with the Apple II. Apple had made a turnover of over $330 million in 1981, a quarter of which was made abroad. An Apple turnover Thompson very much wanted a slice of, and now that Apple had opened European offices in France, Thompson were feeling threatened. Meanwhile, over the English Channel, Sir Clive Sinclair's mail-order ZX80 computer was making waves. The applications for home micros were becoming clear, and the demand was increasing, as was the competition. Thompson was very nearly not a part of that competition because, before their first computer even made it to market, the wider Thompson group was in a lot of trouble by 1982. In this year, while Sinclair was thriving, Thompson was hemorrhaging money with reported losses of over 1 billion francs. That's around 120 million pounds or 170 million US dollars. Whether it was due to national pride or they were simply too big to fail, the French government stepped in, nationalised and restructured it, cutting losses and dead wood from the company in the process. As a result, the state is now the main shareholder of Thompson, but crucially, development of the T07 survives. The state considering not only the development of micros to be important, but also potential advances it could deliver to its Ministry of Defence. And so, the T07 was presented to the press that same year, who praised its exceptional image quality and colours, complemented by an integrated SCART socket. While it impressed visually, it notably lacked a proper sound chip and contained only a beeper for audio. It performed well despite the 7,000 franc price tag, making it more expensive than a Commodore 64, but significantly cheaper than an Apple II. Thompson was now in the shops and, crucially, in the home computer business. Those machines would become more affordable in 1983 when they halved the price. That brought them in line with the Commodore 64 in terms of price, but not in terms of specification, because it still had half the RAM of the Commodore's 64K. That was until 1984 when the new T0770 model was released, which addressed various issues found in the original model. It also expanded the RAM to 64K, extendable to 128K, and introduced a video gate array. The result was a machine that could display 16 instead of 8 colours on the screen at once, as well as an improved keyboard, instead of the chiclet style keys on the launch model. The launch of the T0770 was also complemented by a cut down version, the M05, that had 48k of RAM and it retailed at 2,390 francs, which is about £255 or $400. US The M05e here was also released for export although it was popular within France because the improved keyboard, built-in joystick port and ever so slightly upgraded beeper for beepier beeps made it a more attractive proposition. While the T0770 was targeting the Apple IIs and the Commodore 64s of the world, the M05 was targeting the humble ZX Spectrum market. But there was a problem. MO and TO models were not cross-compatible. Software had to be adjusted by developers in order to make them work on each system. That would go on to be a recurring problem that would haunt Thompson over the duration of its microcomputer lifetime. Les outils de base choisis sont les Danimid Thompson, le MO5, véritable R5 de la micro, et le TO770. Just as the UK had a thriving Computers for Schools program which saw the BBC Micro land in most schools across the country, France launched Plan Informatique pour tous, or the Computers for All plan. This plan was initiated and led by politician Jean-Jacques Servan scriber who made it clear that his preferred choice for the program of 120,000 machines in 50,000 schools was a customised Apple Macintosh. Américaine, le Macintosh, Fabriqué par Apple, le numéro un mondial de la microinformatique. And so, meetings took place with Apple's Steve Jobs and John Scully, in which Jobs explained to the French delegates his vision for them of a computer that would liberate people, give them creativity and freedom. Sentiments echoed in the famous Apple George Orwell commercial of 1984. Liberation, freedom and creativity, surely enough to tick the boxes of any proud French politician. 
The Macintoshes would include 256 kilobytes of RAM, double the standard specification after Jobs' initial rejection of a requested 512 kilobytes, and networking abilities should be built in. Apple also signalled their intention to build an ultra-modern manufacturing unit in France, shifting from its planned Irish site, which would allow them to supply 120,000 machines at a cost of 10 to 12,000 francs per unit. That's about 1,050 pounds or 1,350 US dollars. And that, which was inclusive of favourable bulk pricing, was the worm in the apple. The French state could purchase five homegrown Thompson MO5s for the cost of one Apple Macintosh. The apple was just too expensive to swallow. France needed its own apple and turned to French companies XL Vision, Leonard, SMT Groupil, Bull, Log Abax and Thompson. Thompson won a contract to initially deliver 40,000 computers, a boon for the company although it was won at the expense of very tight profit margins. Thompson, however, were hopeful that school children would want the continuity of owning the same micros at home as they had at school and also attempted to profit from the ongoing maintenance of the machines in the schools. But they priced their services so highly that it soon became obvious that it was more economical for schools to operate their own in-house IT services. The project, though, would popularise the NanoRisu, or Nano Network, a small computer network of Thompson computers, for example, managed by a central PC, which could send programmes to the terminals to execute. Like every kid my age who grew up in France, I was exposed to Thompson computers for the better part of the 80s, uh, even though I never owned one, because those computers were at school, uh, primary school, middle school, and I even remember a computer room at ski camp with MO5s and TO7s. The keyboard was funny because there were two versions. People who had an MO5 at home had a like decent claggy keyboard, but the keyboards we had were rubbery and gummy and really sucked. I think maybe it was because they didn't want the classrooms to be super noisy, so they, they didn't put the claggy keyboards there. The classrooms had like a bunch of MO5s and they were all hooked up with, I couldn't tell you what type of cable to uh, a PC running DOS and the teacher would load whatever programs he wanted to use from a floppy on the PC who would then push the, the programs to all the MO5s in the room at the same time and then the class would start. What I remember from that time was that loading the programs from uh, the network was like super fast compared to loading cassettes like I was doing at home and I remember learning two languages there. So the beginner language uh, was Logo. And the point of Logo, what you would do as a kid, was program a little turtle that was just a green triangle on the screen. And you would give it instructions like, lift the pen, uh, move 50, turn right, put down the pen, move uh, three, etc., to make drawings. Uh, the second language we were learning was uh, Microsoft Basic. Uh, it came in a cartridge, and well, that was just a normal Basic. What was cool learning it at Computer Club was that uh, I learned a little more than what I could pick up by myself, copying listings from magazines and books on my home computer. Uh, so all in all, I'm really grateful for these little computers because I learned a lot from them. Uh, and I'm also grateful for the opportunity to have access to them. And uh, I think it was pretty good that every kid could access these computers, especially for kids who couldn't, even kids who couldn't afford any because it was not a given at the time. Uh, however, as a conclusion, I would say that I was pretty relieved a few years later when I needed a new computer that my parents didn't get me one of these. Uh, I got a Terry ST instead, and uh, that's about it, about the Thompson computers, back to the cave. Outside of the educational arena, the arrival of the Amstrad CPC in France introduced a well-priced competitor in the home micro market, while the debut of the Amiga 1000 potentially painted a picture of the future of computing beyond 8-bit micros. Until now, Thompson's focus had been on recreating the success of Apple, and with the help of the Computer Plan for All, 
It had managed to sell over half a million machines, many of them MO5s. The foresight that had led them to create the machine in the first place, however, was now waning, and their focus on the 8-bit market was at the detriment of having a 16-bit machine prepared for the next generation. Only now did they start making moves to develop a 16-bit micro in collaboration with the British company Acorn and its now parent company Olivetti, after the Italian firm bought out Acorn in 1985. The machine was optimistically planned for release in April 1987, and so came the second generation of Thompson computers. Or did they? The T09 was launched in 1985 with 128K of RAM, upgradable to 192K. A disk drive was included and a PC-like case with a detachable keyboard to give the machine a more classy look, although it was somewhat let down by its plastic construction. While the T0770 was intended to be a French Apple II, the T09 was to be the French Macintosh. With new video modes including a two-color 640x200 high-resolution mode, and a total palette of 4,096 colours. Until now, the pen had been the standard peripheral, but now a mouse port was included and a 6-bit audio DAC. But at the heart of the T09, Thompson's new powerhouse on the computing scene was the very same 1 MHz 8-bit CPU of first-generation models. This was second-generation by age alone and not by technical advancement. Thompson would go on to repeat its mistakes with a slew of new model releases in the face of an increasingly popular and easy to understand Amstrad CPC range. The 464, 664 and 6128. Demonstrated here by Thomas. Thompson released no less than six models between 1985 and 1987, including the M06 with joystick and sound upgrade, the M05NR which was an M06 with built-in networking to support those nano networks, the T08, which had 256K of RAM and more video modes. The T09 Plus, which was a T09 with 512K of RAM and a built-in modem. And the T08D, which was a T08 with a built-in floppy drive. And of course, what they all had in common was that 1 MHz 8-bit CPU, used all the way back in their 1982 model. One man who experienced this second wave of machines firsthand was MO6 owner Nicholas, and here he is sharing his memories of that time with us. Hello, Cape Dwellers. I got an MO6 around 87 maybe. We didn't buy it actually, um, but we won it. My mother, she filled the contest entry form uh, with a pair of underpants that she bought for me. And surprise, surprise, two months later we had a, a big box waiting for us. I was so excited, uh, but my mother wanted to wait for my father to come back from work before opening it. Initially, I didn't really realize that there were other computers out there and possibly better ones. Uh, it did happen, though, maybe one year after we got to Thompson, I went to visit a friend who had a Commodore 64 and we played Bruce Lee on it. And I remember thinking at the time, yeah, I wish I'd had this one instead. I used the MO6 exclusively for games. One I really liked was called Leglodor, the Golden Eagle, I guess. Uh, it was an adventure slash RPG game uh, where you had to explore a castle. Another one I liked was Entropy, Entropy, um, but it actually scared me a little with uh, its dark graphics and ominous sound effects and weird enemies, so I didn't play it for too long usually. By the time we thought about upgrading, uh, Thompson had stopped making computers and it didn't really make sense to stick with 8 bits anyway. So we got an Atari ST instead, uh, but this one didn't get set up uh, in my bedroom, unfortunately. And the MO6 was quickly forgotten. It's still in my parents' basement somewhere, and my father actually dug it up when I was talking about it a couple of days ago. And looking at it, the poor thing is really in the need of a trash to treasure style restoration, I think. In 1986, Thompson had a decision to make. With no third generation machine to expand on their questionable second generation range, Amstrad now dominating the French home computer market and the threat of MSX computers becoming the new standard, Thompson 
decided to adopt the IBM PC compatible approach. The educational sector was still Thomson's primary target and they did manage to win a tender to supply a not unsubstantial 13,000 IBM PC compatibles to schools and colleges in 1987 with their new TO16, PCM and XP range of computers. Five prototypes of a Motorola 68000 based TO16 were produced but consigned to the scrap heap as Thomson committed fully to IBM PC compatibles. As 1988 rolled around after selling just 60,000 of a forecast 150,000 computers, the writing was really on the wall for Thompson. And by January 1989, the inevitable announcement was made. Thompson had now abandoned microcomputing, citing that they intended to focus on consumer and defence electronics. The French home computer market was Amstrad's to dominate until the Ataris, Amigas and eventually PCs took a hold. And Thompson became... Yet another footnote in 8-bit micro history. In many ways, the Thompson story apes that of the Minitel over here. Thompson's attitude of build it and they will come was a great mentality in the application of their creation. Their entry into the market was well received despite a slightly higher than normal price tag. Sales were good, but over time, whether it was due to state ownership or just mismanagement, that foresight was lost and with it the reputation of the company. Despite producing a high quality PC in their TO16, which was very well received by the press, the damage was done. Thompsons were associated with old computers that lived in the corners and cupboards of neglected classrooms. Thompson didn't vanish though. They continued to produce and sell consumer electronics, as was their focus now. And then in 2015, their name appeared on laptops in the style of the slimline Apple MacBook. So while the story of their first foray into microcomputers didn't end well for them, the story is far from over. And maybe this time, they'll think different. I hope you'll join me in part two, where we look at the MO5E specifically, show it in use, and put it head to head with its arch rival, the Amstrad CPC. Until then, thank you for watching and take care. If you enjoyed this video and you'd like to support future similar content, then why not join the list of people scrolling up the screen here on Patreon with a small donation to the cave. Thank you each and every one of you for your ongoing support.